Um, on that note, I'm going to welcome everybody back. Uh, this is the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is going to be part seven of our study of the Bhadra Maya Kara uh, 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 Vyakaranya Sutra. I'm going to try to give the full title tonight. Um, this is probably going to be our concluding uh, session on this sutra. Um, we only have a little bit more to do. Um, and it should be kind of a fun night as a kind of a wrap up or a conclusion of the sutra. Um, I'm going to sort of just remind you a little bit of what happened in the previous episodes because it, it sort of pertains to this evening's topic here. Um, so this is one of those beautiful Mahayana Buddhist sutras um, that comes from the Ratnakuta collection. And, you know, this collection here, I hold up the book pretty much every Sunday night. So this Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, these are beautiful, you know, Mahayana Sutras that certainly don't get uh, as much attention, I think, as they, they should be getting. Um, and this is one of those fun ones, uh, like many Mahayana Sutras, that has a narrative. And this narrative has been about the magician named Bhadra, or the illusionist Bhadra. He's a Mayakara. He's a, a, he works with Maya. He works with illusions in that sense. And um, I mentioned, or I, I said, that the real full title of this sutra in Sanskrit, we don't have a Sanskrit version of this, so we're doing what is called a back translation from the Chinese of what we imagine it was called. Um, I believe somewhere actually the, there's a list of Sanskrit titles of these original from Sanskrit. So we actually do know a lot of the titles of these. And I, this is one of them. And so this is the Bhadra Mayakara Vyakaranya Sutra. And that last part of it, I talked about probably at episode one, and that Vyakaranya is, well, it could be just translated as prophecy. That sounds a little weird coming from the world of Buddhism, of course, so it's a tricky term. But the way this is um, translated in our good old fashioned uh, Chang edition is a, it is the prophecy of the magician Bhadra's attainment of enlightenment all right and so that's um we're gonna have to talk about that tonight that's going to be a topic but i want to remind you that this was or is bajra the magician who at the beginning of the sutra he had a plan he was going to trick the buddha he was going to create an illusion and trick the buddha and by virtue of, have, of deceiving or tricking the Buddha, he felt that he could then win the reputation of Rajgriha, of, of the, the city that we're in. And what happens, of course, is that nobody can get one over on the Buddha, right? And so this story becomes what I was saying last time. It becomes a conversion story. It is about Bhadra sort of coming around to the Dharma. And that's indeed the story that we've talked about. That's what happened. And this sutra traces Bhadra's conversion experience into three steps. <clears throat> the first step is that, <clears throat> excuse me, he has or enters a samadhi, a deep concentration where he sees nothing but the Buddha everywhere. That was the first kind of step on the path. And we talked a lot about that in episodes past. It was a big moment when this happened to Bhadra. And the only thing I want to remind you of really quickly is that idea of Bhadra or anyone sort of having this vision of the body of the Buddha being everywhere is a very Mahayana Buddhist sentiment. 
and what it is sort of um, working against, so to speak, is a earlier, um, uh, what would be called a Hinayana, small vehicle, but an earlier Buddhist view that the Buddha was a person. Maybe he was called Siddhartha, maybe he's called Gautama, but the idea was the Buddha was a person. And within the early Buddhist tradition, there was a deep reverence for that person in a kind of guru-like way, a teacherly way. And within the Mahayana, that sort of shifts a little bit. And yes, there is all due reverence and respect for the historical figure, the sort of Nirmanakaya, the transformation body of the Buddha from 2,500 years ago. But within the Mahayana tradition, it sort of uh, moves against that idea of sort of uh, personifying the Buddha in such a human, all too human way in that sense. And so Bhadra has this kind of Mahayana realization of the Buddha's everywhere, so to speak. That led, that kind of vision led to Bhadra's second transformation experience. And that's when he attained um, attained, uh, samapati is the word, but this idea of, of reaching or attaining this anu dharma kashanti, this uh, patience with the dharma, this kashanti with the dharma. And that's what I talked about a little bit more in detail last time. That kind of is a stepping stone or a way, a, a, a midway point to the final realization, the final samapati, the final uh, attainment of Bhadra, which is what I have written on the board here. So this anupatika dharma kashanti, which is usually translated as the birthlessness of all things, the non-arising of all phenomena, uh, uh, wushang, Faren is the Chinese for this. Uh, that's my attempt at writing. My calligraphy is not very good, so don't use it as a standard. But that's how they say it in the, the Chinese text that we're reading from. That's the big, long Sanskrit word. And I just want to remind you what happens. When Bhadra has this attainment, realizes this, and attains this particular type of kashanti, this particular type of patient tolerance or patient endurance or this just peacefulness is how I was defining kashanti last time, the root of the word being shanti, peace or peacefulness. Uh, so it's a type of it's a type of peacefulness. When he had that realization, he levitated actually he rose to the height of seven palm trees and that's what our mural last time was little bhadra was on top of his seven palm trees having just attained this anupatika dharma kashanti at which point this really wild thing happens and this is where i left us last time when the magician bhadra attains this the Buddha smiles. And from his smile radiates light. And this light swirls all around and then enters back into the Ushnisha, into the, the protrudence on top of the Buddha's head. And at that point, the Buddha's young cousin Ananda is you know, awestruck, and he wonders, what is the reason for the Buddha's smile? And that is the kind of the cliffhanger that I, I left you with last time. And I'm going to leave you hanging there just a little bit longer because, you know, last, all, all Dharma doors are, are, you know, we get into it, so it gets heavy. And so even though Bhadra's attainment culminates in this Kishanti, I didn't do a lot of talking about it because we had come to the end of the session. 
And so I think before we really uh, approach the Buddha's smile and what it means, I want us to have a much better understanding of what, what did Bhajra realize that made the Buddha smile? What is this Kashanti? What is this particular type of Kashanti? So we're going to start tonight with a, um, I guess you would call it a Dharma talk. But we're going to start with a, a, a discussion of this Kashanti. And then we'll get back to the story and the smile and the light. And I'm going to finish reading the sutra. So let's do a quick uh, language thing here. Um, so again, I already mentioned Kashanti, and I spent a lot of time on that word Kashanti last time. Again, patience, tolerance, peacefulness. The main gist of this kashanti, which um, I want to remind you, it's one of the paramitas, right? It's the third of our six paramitas or third of 10 paramitas, depending on the list you're using. And the main gist of this kashanti, right? The first paramita is dana, giving, generosity, right? Pretty, pretty easy to kind of wrap your head around that paramita. The second one, moral discipline, you know, um, avoiding false speech, avoiding harsh speech, avoiding killing, these things that kind of are about morality or shila, that's the second paramita. Pretty standard stuff when it comes to Buddhism, moral discipline. But kashanti, kashanti is a little tricky, but it's not really. I think the key just to grasp it and just to give us something to work with tonight, you know, in case you didn't watch the first six episodes or something, the basic idea of Kashanti is this kind of peacefulness. They even uh, poetically describe it as a kind of armor. But the idea is, is that one practicing peacefulness or practicing kashanti is not easily moved, not easily stirred, not easily gotten to, and in particular, not easily angered. In fact, the real culminating stage of kashanti is not even about not easily moved, but actually achala, immovable. And by immovable or not being moved or not being stirred, we are very much talking about emotional stirrings. We're very much, again, talking about kind of anger and the giving rise to anger. You know, and so you could imagine, you know, somebody uh, calls you a name or something and you, you know, you get stirred by that. You're, hey, don't call me, you know, you, we're giving rise to anger, right? And so this practice of kashanti is about this sort of, again, peacefulness, not getting stirred, and in particular, not giving rise to anger. I did a lot of talking about that last time. I always like to repeat this though. In Buddhism, we're not interested in repressing anger. It's not about repressing and holding back anger in that sense. If anger arises, anger arises. And then we stop and we notice it. So this is not about repressing anger, but it's actually a kind of an exercise in wisdom or pranya in that sense, where we want to take a really close look at anger, in particular, that emotion of anger, and sort of notice how it might be harming us and might be harming those around us. And basically coming to the realization that, you know what? Nothing good comes of anger. No, nothing for me, nothing for the other person. Could it be that anger is this holdover from millions of years ago of self-defense mechanisms and baring our teeth and growling? Could it be that? Maybe, right? But the wisdom here says, oh, this knot in my stomach, this knot in my heart, this feeling of anger, this doesn't feel good to me. 
It's not doing me any good. And again, if you apply a little bit of wisdom, you realize it doesn't do any good to anybody. And I want to just leave it at that. Again, if you want to see, hear more about Kashanti, check out part six. But that's the kind of the mood we're in tonight. Kashanti, this peacefulness, this tranquility, that kind of uh, patience. So there's a few different types of Kashanti we have learned. And this is sort of considered the, the highest type of Kashanti. And so it is a Kashanti, it's a kind of patient tolerance for the Anupatika Dharma, or it is the patient tolerance for this non-arising of all phenomena or the birthlessness of all things. So let me just talk a little bit quickly about that. So the Chinese is actually helpful here. Um, let's see, I guess we're these two. Um, so the Chinese is without birth, but the Chinese character Shang, it means arising. I didn't do a very good job my character, but it's actually a pictograph of a tiny little sprout popping out of the ground. And there's a little, uh, little bit of dirt flying off the side of it. And so it's like a sprout, it's a, an arising, but it's also the word that you would use for a birth, the birth of an animal, the birth of a human, birth. And so this already gets tricky, uh, linguistically speaking, because the idea is, is that if we're talking about a, if we're talking about what we conceive of as a human or any kind of mammal or a bird, or whether it's born of an egg or born of metamorphosis, as the Buddha says, no matter how it's born, you would talk about it as being born if it's a living thing. But if we're talking about an inanimate object, something that is not living, I don't know, like a, I don't know, the book, right? The book. So if we are talking about a book, we would actually still say wusheng, lacking birth, but you could think of inanimate objects as lacking arising, coming into being. And so the language is tricky from the beginning because it, we're kind of, um, well, we're at an artificial divide between living and non-living and then having two words for, oh, you're a living thing, then you were born. Oh, you're a book, then you were manufactured. You were printed, right? But I just want you to know that the, the, this, dharma, this kishanti, this type of patience, what we're talking about is absolutely equally applicable to beings, living beings of all sorts of say shapes and sizes, and it's applicable to all uh, phenomena. In fact, the Buddhists would say it's applicable to all dharmas, and that's that other word. So that's the anupatika, the non-arising or the birthlessness of all dharmas. And of course, within the Mahayana Buddhist tradition in particular, a dharma is anything you could possibly think of. <laughs> no matter how big, no matter how small, uh, no matter how not uh, ephemeral or imaginary, whatever. If, if you can think of it, it's a dharma in that sense. And so a dharma in, in this way just means a thing, a phenomena, some, some object, something, could be a person, could be a book. And so this is the realization of Bhadra, and it's a very, very important uh, realization that kind of, well, I don't want to say it, it is like the hallmark of Mahayana Buddhism. There's a, a lot of things that kind of set Mahayana Buddhist, Buddhism off. Um, but this particular idea, and all of these ideas we're going to talk about tonight are really at the heart of Mahayana Buddhism. And so I want to give you a very good, solid, 
uh, example for how to think about this? What are they talking about? And, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, also a warning, this is the highest, like one of the highest attainments that a bodhisattva can kind of achieve in that way. So it's difficult for me to just say it. I don't really make full claims to having attained this kashanti. Um, and I don't fully expect everyone to just instantly get it and elevate to the, to the height of seven palm trees. But let's see what we can do. I'm, I'm open to the possibility, so. Okay, so again, what we're gonna be talking about is, and, and I'll get to the Kishanti part of this in a moment. Let's just talk about what it means for all phenomena, all dharmas, all things, to be without origination, without birth, without coming into existence. In order to do that, I thought it would be really appropriate, really, really appropriate, uh, since this is the magician Bhadra Sutra, I just thought it would be appropriate if I did a magic trick. So many of you have seen my magic tricks. I only have a few. Uh, so I share this magic trick for those who have not seen it. And even if you have seen it, you know, it's always worth thinking about again. It's always kind of worth reconsidering. And so the example that I like to use to describe this idea, it's actually the, the same magic trick I, I like to use to demonstrate emptiness, shunyata. And emptiness, of course, has been a big part of this sutra. It's that is maybe the hallmark of Mahayana Buddhism is the emphasis on this idea of emptiness, shunyata. So this is a magic trick I use to demonstrate emptiness and to demonstrate this idea of the birthlessness of phenomena. So here we go. It goes a little something like this. What is that? Right? So there's a nice group here, so I'm not going to do a poll of what everybody thinks that is. But in all of my years of doing this magic trick, it's a pretty unanimous response that I get in terms of what that is. I often hear it's a fist. And so if you were thinking it's a fist, then that's, that's the idea. So here we are looking at a fist, right? I've added a, a, a twist to this magic trick. I don't think I've ever actually really done this magic trick quite so virtually like this. And so this is gonna be fun because of my magic sheet here. So here's the magic trick. Pay very close attention to the fist, you ready? Where'd the fist go? That's the question. Where did the fist go, right? Better yet, where did the fist come from? Where did it arise from? So these are, this is what we're interested in, right? Where did it come from and where did it go, right? So here we are again, looking at the fist. And for right now, for the way I defined it earlier, we could call the fist a dharma. It's a concept, it's an idea, it's a phenomena, here it is. I've been talking about it for about a minute now, right? So here's the fist and I won't, um, you know, continue with the magic trick, but I'll show it to you one more time in a very interesting Buddhist way, right? Watch very closely, right? Nirvana, blown out, right? I blew the fist out. So again, the question is, where did the fist go? There was a fist here a second ago, right? Wait, is it over there? Maybe it's over there. Let me check the, the sheet again, right? No, it's not here. 
so the question becomes again where did it where did it go and of course you know it didn't go anywhere you know that it didn't go anywhere what we could say sort of you know initially from a buddhist point of view is we could say well the conditions for its existence are no longer present we we could say that that would be a very good buddhist answer that the conditions for the fist are no longer present and therefore there's just no longer a fist right but what's really interesting about this example of the fist is that in terms of um matter call it right you know in terms of say the four great elements in terms of solidity liquidity temperature and movement in terms of matter what constituted the fist a moment ago all of that all of that matter it's still right here right so i'll ask it one more time where'd the fist go and of course related to our our topic tonight actually in many ways what we might oh uh, yeah we are more probably more interested in this right now where did it come from where was it born from whence did it arise and so as we go through this exercise you may finally come to an understanding that the word fist is an idea and it's a concept that you have in your head have in your mind in that sense and so it may be that it's not so much that there was a fist out here but a fist in there and because something came along that matched what was in there you oh there's a fist there and what my magic trick is designed to show you is that the fist is not that kind of thing it's not something that came from anywhere it didn't actually arise and it didn't really cease in that way the idea again of course is that the fist so to speak is an idea a concept that is well i'm going to retract this statement in a second but it's an idea that you have in your head in that way or in your mind where this gets really really interesting is is when i say what's that And you would then say a hand, and we could go through this whole process again. But the hand seems like it's it's undeniably uh, an object here, like for real. And then I would ask the question, okay, where did that come from, right? Was it was it born along with me, all those years ago? Was it born, and now here it is, and in however long it'll eventually die is that how this hand works or is a hand also a concept or an idea that this is this is matching that idea and so you're inclined to think there's a hand out here right so that's the a demonstration of both emptiness because what we could say is is that because this thing oh that whoa did you see a fist because this fist e so easily comes in and out of existence it's almost as if it doesn't have an inherent nature all by itself it's almost as if it's entirely conditional conditional on a lot ideas concepts language minds to think about all of those things so it's conditional but as far as the fist having a substantial real existence 
we could say that the nature of the fist is empty. That's how it so easily comes in and out of existence, right? And so the idea here is, is that the fist, the hand, their nature is empty in that sense. And because there's kind of, let me say it again in a way, there's no hand or fist out here. There's just a hand or a fist in there, so to speak, right? So in that way, the fist, the hand out here, over here, never comes in and out of existence. It's all happening sort of over there. But now we need to go that deeper step forward. And that deeper step forward is, is that this teaching, this teaching of emptiness and this teaching of the non-arising of all phenomena, it applies to anything and everything that you could possibly think of, including the idea or concept of you. The head I referenced earlier, the head is an idea or a concept. The brain, the Michael. In fact, it's almost as if, 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 if it's a word, it's just a word. It's just a concept. That is the, the, the realm that we're playing in tonight. This realm where we're, we're realizing, oh, wow, everything is going to be a, just kind of a concept or an idea in that way, and therefore empty, and therefore not arising, not ceasing in that sense. And that goes for the perceiver of this as well. And we are right back into our classic Buddhist Dharma of anatta or anatman, the no self. And of course, if, if, uh, if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you, would re you, you know that I've said this many times, the big you know, Mahayana revolution happened when you know, as the Heart Sutra puts it, when the Bodhisattva realizes that the five skandhas are empty. Not just Michael, the socially constructed idea of a self, not just that idea of a self is empty, but actually all phenomena, all dharmas in that sense. How does everybody feel about that? Everybody feeling okay with that? Like what always comes to my mind when we talk about this um, is actually what um, Krishnamurti said, and I think I mentioned that once in our talk, and I liked it so much. It's um, um, tell a child the name of the bird, and the child never sees the bird again. Beautiful. Very beautiful. Um, that's one thing, and then the second thing that comes to my mind, like you know, this this idea of something, including ourselves um starts when we start um when there is a self-reference you know it's it, i think it happens when you're two or three or something like that which is kind of i was thinking like how could we how could the person a human being could ex escape that because once we get into self-reference the whole samsara starts right the whole suffering and conditioning and blah blah but it seems like this is just a just what evolution does right it's like we can't escape it so anyway a few thoughts yeah yeah beautiful connie and i think that um what <clears throat> the uh, both the ideas that you said will really relate to actually a ananda so ananda has this poem he recites i'm gonna read ananda's poem and I, it's gonna uh, resonate a lot with what connie just said thanks connie okay so it sounds like Connie's on uh, uh, right there. And I think, you know, all of us are in that sense. And so that is the idea of the birthlessness or non-origination of all phenomena. Now, I want to I wanna say one more thing before we kind of go a little bit deeper with this, which is, you know, oh, look, it's back. And there's a very, very, uh, even subtler aspect to this teaching. 
And the really, really subtle aspect to the non-arising of all dharmas, the birthlessness of all dharmas, the really subtle aspect of that is that, well, look, <laughs> it's a fist. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, is that just because you maybe have a realization of the birthlessness of all phenomena, it's, it's not that things disappear. It's not that things evaporate when you have this realization. And what I mean is, is that Buddhism, again, Mahayana Buddhism in particular, has a very, very special word, a special term called tathata, suchness. And the idea here is, is that when you are conceiving of a fist or perceiving a fist, it is such. It is so. Behold. Behold. Tathata. Tathata is this deeply, deeply present state of awareness in which what is is what is. Where we miss it, where we become deluded in a sense, is when we think it's a real thing that then has an origin and has a uh, a cessation. That's where we miss it, when we put it in time, when we put it as an existent that has a before, during, and after. But again, I have already taken care of the after because where did it go? If it was really a thing, it went somewhere. I could find it. I could find its trace record. But again, the magic trick is to show you it's not that type of thing. And in fact, all dharmas are like that. So being sort of in touch with Tathata is kind of the name of the game. And what that entails is the patient endurance for the birthlessness of all phenomena. Because the idea here is, is that fists, abstract concepts, stuff like that, it's very, very easy to abandon uh, a concept or something like that. But when it comes to our own existence, it's a little harder to just tathagata, to arise out of tathata, which is what tathagata means, to come out of tathata. That's a little, that's a little harder because we are very convinced of our birth. We're very convinced in a way of our, our uh, death in that sense. We're very convinced of this process in that sense. And so whether it's our own existence, the ex existence of our loved ones, the existence of our, our whatever, to actually abide peacefully with the birthlessness of all things is not actually super easy. And that's one reason why it's a kashanti. It's a patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all things. Because again, it's easy to let go of things maybe we don't like or something or things that are abstract already. But this is again, applying to everything. And so that is this highest or not high, highest form of kashanti and a very, very, very high samapati, a very high attainment. Um, yeah, let me leave it at that because we have a, a lot to read, or not a lot, but I have a lot to comment on the reading. So everybody feeling okay about the theme tonight? Birthlessness of all phenomena, right? Light work. It's light work tonight, really. Okay. Um, like one thing that came to my mind, but Buddhism is obviously not nihilist, nihilistic. So they they talk about emptiness and non-arising and non-dissolving, but at the same time they acknowledge. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's in the it's in the idea of nihilism. 
I've, I just, I just <sighs> did away with nihility, as it would be called. The idea that all, thi- that, you know, the nihilism, nihilism and that attitude, it's all predicated on the, the death of everything. That's what nihility means, that all things eventually destro- are destroyed. So why bother? I, I just took it so far beyond nihility in that sense. Okay, here I'd like to actually, uh, first of all, I got the privilege to uh, translate uh, most of the Tripitaka in Bengali. So I have little knowledge, not, but I really appreciate this is the first time I'm seeing so deep full a talking, a Buddhist Dharma talking. And I really surprised the knowledge Mr. Owens have. I'm really surprised. And I really, uh, I mean, I don't know how to express. But here is the one thing, yes, uh, what I am saying, if I ask Kwani uh, to explain it to others, what I just said, when he will explain that to others, in translation or in carrying, my meaning will lost a little bit. Right? So what I understood, even though Buddhism has also, all Dharma has the same thing, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, all, what is, we don't get it today. Up to us, it didn't come exactly. What Buddha said, what Buddha did, we didn't receive it because of too many schools mm. produce their way of saying what Buddha said. For example, Buddha in his living lifetime never asked to make a Buddha statue. Okay, so in the Mohana explanation and Hinana explanation, like you see that we are using what when we're explaining or referencing Tripitaka, like he was saying, he was saying Keshanti. I'll say, no, it's, uh, I'm going for Pali style. I'll say Kanti. You see, already <laughs> makes a difference, but we are talking the same, you see, or Chinese term. So we are talking, we're trying to do the same, but as for different schools comes into play, it makes again a difference. For example, emptiness. Like he's talking a very important factor today, which is conditional, right? What he's trying to say, condition change, same I or you or we change. For example, it's I, you're saying it's I, right? You're proving, yeah, I saw you, you have a white, you have a this I and it is you. So it is I, right? I agree. Mm-hmm. Now tell me, I is named by you, you give me an identity, right? Okay. So that identity also change. How? Let me explain it. I, myself, in my one lifetime, this whole lifetime is I, right? It's me, I, right? So once I don't like dry fish. I hate it. I cannot even afford the smell, right? Okay. And the same I got in love with a, let's say, African woman who loves dry fish. I need to love with him. And now start to tolerance like Kanti, right? Now with tolerance and mm. love, what happens in long-term? I'll get kind of addicted. And that bad smell will become a smell of peace. <laughs> you see? So condition change, not only water change inspired, but we, I, we, you change too, right? So same thing, when emptiness we are talking about, I was earlier in a, another, I was in bow of silence long time. And uh, last two weeks back, I did came back. So now I'm started trying to join different groups that, is, that has also a, a reason for it, a lot of reasons. So uh, people actually asked me like, like emptiness you are saying, you see that conditional and I say unconditional. So condition change, definition change, right? Yep. So can someone explain me, how can I, for example, make you better example? There is a conditional love, a wife asking to husband, love me, love me, love me, but love me only. And he's asking, make this love unconditional. Hmm. 
So a husband's life, husband's asking wife, right? Husband and wife is conditional, right? If it is not conditional, that love should not be for husband to wife. Is what I'm saying? So when husband is asking to wife, love me, love me, love me alone, and he is not accepting the reality, condition change, it will change. You see? So unconditional love, can somebody pursue me? How can we pursue the unconditional love? You hmm. see? So as putting these questions, I mean, I, I was trying to actually assist <laughs> Mr. Owens because I saw that how much he read about all those things and how very intelligently, very intelligent, not only intelligently, he was referencing things and doing things. I was first he was like, I, this is the first time I know some. I know some others people in, in a different thing, but never in metaverse. That's what I meant for. There's a lot of very wise person in Western, but uh, I should say uh, in meetup groups, uh, when I really, I, mean, I don't know how to thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right. On, on, the, on that beautiful note, I'm going to uh, continue. So I'm going to get back to the Buddha's smile. So here we go. So that was all, again, uh, to remind us of what did Bajra realize that made him uh, rise to the height of seven palm trees and what made the Buddha smile in that way. But we don't know exactly why the Buddha smiled. And so now I'm going to return to the sutra and uh, I'm going to uh, read from the top and we'll see how it goes. I have a few uh, notes. So <clears throat> at that time, the venerable Ananda thought the Tathagata, worthy and perfectly enlightened, has not smiled this way without a reason. Ananda then rose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground, joined his palms together, faced the Buddha, and spoke a gatha to question. Universally heard in the triple realm, everywhere known and honored, in the station of authority and wisdom, inconceivable. Having already reached the other shore of Bodhi and all its merits, for what reason do you now manifest this smile? The ten directions and five destinies of sentient beings, the mental motions and natures of high, high, middle, and low. The Tathagata in all these cases is able to know these. Now, why do you manifest this smile and for what reason? Among the humans and devas and eight divisions in the great assembly, there are those who are able to produce wonderful sounds. But when compared to the pure voice of the Tathagata, they are not even a tiny fraction by compare. The radiance of the Bhagavan goes throughout the ten directions, universally illuminating innumerable Buddha lands. The light of the sun and the moon and of Mani jewels and Brahma devas is unable to compare with that of the Tathagata. Completely knowing the extremely profound dharma of emptiness, without self, without personality, as well as without sentient being, having fully abandoned the two extremes of existence and non-existence, well knowing that the three times are like the moon's reflection on water. Now, he whose destiny is within the supreme vehicle, who transmits the lineage of the Tathagata's dharma, and who arises within the vast and great triple gem, we wish that you would explain the reason for this smile. The Tathagata's manifestation of light from his smile has a difference for those of different vehicles. If it enters back into the knees or into the shoulders, 
then this is for a person who is in one of the two vehicles. Now, this one releases immeasurable light and this light enters into the crown of the Tathagata, supreme, among dev uh, supreme one among devas. For what person is this Buddha vehicle will supreme one among devas for what purpose is this buddha vehicle will you give assurance to i still didn't get it right supreme one among devas for what person is this buddha vehicle that you give assurance to stick with that <laughs> apologies on the end that's Ananda's Gatha question. I just wanted to comment on two points really quickly. The one line that I think is really key, not that they are all not key, but the one of having fully abandoned the two extremes of existence and non-existence. So that's a key idea, of course, again, in, in Mahayana Buddhism in particular, and in many ways, if you're familiar with uh, Nagarjuna and the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, the fundamental wisdom of the middle way, as it's called, the Madhyamika, the school of Nagarjuna, is called the middle way primarily because of this middle path between existence and non-existence key idea there. And I kind of already sort of intimated at what that means regarding my fist, that it's, it's, there is no fist, but it's not that there's not a fist, <laughs> right? It's, it's it kind of paradoxical, but if you kind of, uh, you know, get the, the Dharma in that way, it makes perfect sense how it is that there is not a fist, but there's not not a fist. And that is the middle path between existence and non-existence in that way. And then the re a really profound line is the one right after that, where Ananda says, well knowing, so he's speaking of the Tathagata, the, the Buddha, well knowing that the three times, past, present, and future, those are the three time periods, well knowing that the three times are like the moon's reflection in water. And I, 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 I could have included this earlier, you know, but when I said, you know, things like abstract concepts and things, they're kind of easy to understand how they have no arising and no ceasing in that way. But when it comes to ideas like the self, or in particular, yesterday, tomorrow, it's a little harder to grok, so to speak, how it is that yesterday is a dharma that also is empty and does not arise or cease. What I mean is, it's a little harder to understand how yesterday, like all of yesterday, is like a fist. Just a word, just a concept, different connotation, but still nonetheless a word or an idea. And of course, what's really interesting about putting yesterday and tomorrow into the framework of birthlessness is we begin to understand how, oh, even the idea of now, is an idea or a concept that is conditional relative to these other ideas like yesterday and tomorrow, which are empty. It's almost as if everything's empty, right? So that's sort of a little commentary on Ananda's line there. Um, any questions, ideas, comments, answers from the poem? Yeah, um, yeah Michael, but yeah. not but and um materialists would argue that whatever you experience is an accumu accumulation of atoms 
maybe not a wrist and maybe not the desk, but uh, so or sub uh, um, uh, particles. So, what does Buddhism like? That's that's the profundity of this. Whether it's something as big as yesterday or as small as an atom, still an idea. It's still a concept. And I want to, uh, you know, use Connie's question to remind you, when we say this, that atoms are empty in that way, and they neither arise nor cease, it's not that we are denying atoms, so to speak. Remember, this is beyond existence and non-existence. And so, I mean, Connie, if I really wanted to answer your question, it would really take the whole Dharma talk away. It's a very, it, Connie always asks the deep questions that run the risk of just sending us in a very uh, beautiful direction. Um, the one thing, and it has a lot to do with, um, I, I'm not going to mispronounce your name, but the gentleman who spoke earlier. You can call me Priya. I know the first one ah, is very difficult. Please wonderful. Thank me. you. Or anything. I don't mind. <laughs> anything. <laughs> anything. You can also call me stupid. And Priya. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I don't mind. I call you Priya. So Priya mentioned a lot about the conditions and condition the conditionality. And that's key actually to what would be a real long answer to Connie's question. And it has to do with the way in which, you know, why, sorry, why a fist? Because a hand. Why a hand? Because fingers. Why hands and fingers? Because of arm, because human, because, because, because. So there's a way in which all these dharmas are deeply interconnected in that way, where any one of these ideas, like a finger, is going to sort of be wrapped up in the idea of a hand that's going to be wrapped up in the idea of a fist and so on and so on. And so, yeah, Connie, as soon as you have whatever it might be, you know, as soon as you have atoms, then you have neutrons and protons and electrons. And as soon as you have an electron, you have electricity. Oh, look, and it's happening. <laughs> so it's sort of, again, it's not about naturalists or scientists being right or wrong in that way. It's about conditionality. And, you know, if I were to sort of just add one little, uh, little bit to that, the real kashanti here or the real practice is not clinging too hard to a particular perspective on all that, but certainly not abandoning it rashly for some other perspective. We really want to observe <laughs> what's going on in that way so yeah tanya um when we were talking about birthlessness i was thinking about co-arising and like you know there's sort of the same they're very related right i mean because if everything's co-arising it's just like bam everything's there it's like not um everything's happening at once right there's no time it's just bam so there's no co there's no birth there's no death it's just kapow <laughs> yeah kapow yeah yeah and you know you can kind of toggle between an enlightened perspective where it's kapow and a kind of diluted ignorant perspective where there is yesterday the day before that all the way back to the day i was born and then again the danger of that thinking the danger of seeing it that way is that you got to look that way then too. And so if you're clinging to the birth, if you're clinging to the birth, I got bad news for you. But if you're into Kachow, I've got great news for you. Yes, Priya. Oh. Yeah, today, earlier, I had the another forum to say, what is the definition of meditation? What, Say is that the, again? what is the definition of meditation? So I said, uh, it's, a, it's beyond my capacity to explain in a day. 
if you give me only 24 hours, I cannot explain it because it needs more hours. Yeah. Then they said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm talking about giving you example to prove my attestation of my statement. Let's say when a novice start meditation, they start learning things like loving kindness or deep breathing in and out. And deep breathing is very connected to mind and body and they got calm and quietness. So they feel, oh, this is that, this is meditation. Okay, so for them, this is the kind of definition of meditation. But when we see whatever schools you follow doesn't matter, whatever technique of meditation you follow doesn't matter. But when you come into deep meditation, we start to see the seeds, what in Buddhist language you say seeds, comes in, it can be a negative one or positive one, which negative in a sense, giving you pain or sufferings or positive one giving you smile, right? That comes in, even a deep meditator and he purifying through it. So for him, that meditator, that is the happiness and that is the definition of meditation. Mm -hmm. So you see two different things. We are talking about same subject meditation, but to explain it really, we need to have stage two stage to pass. If you are my questioner, then I had to, I cannot explain you until or unless you understand what is deep meditation. You see? So I think what uh, Vance is doing today, it is a very difficult position, situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, <laughs> when explaining certain things, that's why I, I was I thinking, I was, I was thinking probably I need to add this to all of us so we can really evaluate, I mean, so what, Wens is trying to do. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> sometimes see, I see that he has a depth. Sometimes it's really not possible to explain, you know, like a one plus one equal to two. <laughs> Thank you, Wens. Thank, Thank you, Priya. Priya, he's got a good theme tonight. <laughs> okay, so we we need to get to the smile. We because it's it's eight o'clock, so we got to talk about the smile. Yeah. So. Here is the answer. So at that time, the world honored one, the Bhagavan, spoke to Ananda saying, do you see Bhadra? Ananda replied, I see him. The Buddha told Ananda, this good man after 92,000 kalpas in the land of Mahavyuha, of great adornment during the kalpa of skillful transformations will attain Buddhahood. He will be named Vikravanya Raja Tathagata, the spiritual transformation king Tathagata, worthy and perfectly enlightened one. In that Buddha land, the people will flourish in peaceful tranquility and comfort. The earth will be level and as soft as cotton. The flowering trees and fruit trees will all be arranged evenly in rows. It will be adorned with hanging banners and precious canopies. A multitude of wondrous sounds and wonderful fragrances will spontaneously permeate everywhere. If drinks or food are necessary, then they will arrive in a single thought. All the, all the provisions received and furnishings arisen there will be like those of the 33 heavens and no different. In that land, there will always be a proliferation of adornments and therefore its name is the land of great adornment. In that land, all the people will abide in the Mahayana, the great vehicle with deep and solid faith. That Vikravanya Raja Tathagata, that spiritual transformation King Tathagata will have a lifespan of 10,000 years. And the correct Dharma will abide in that world for 10 billion years. Before the time of his, before the time of his Nirvana, so he will give renowned Bodhisattva the prediction of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, Supreme Unsurpassable Enlightenment, saying, in the next kalpa, you will attain Buddhahood. 
and will be named all surpassing Tathagata, worthy and perfectly enlightened one. When Bhadra heard the Tathagata's prediction, he descended from the sky, bowed his head at the feet of the Buddha. He then said, I now take refuge in the Tathagata, worthy and perfectly enlightened one, as well as the Dharma and the Sangha. Thusly, he sought to repeat this innumerable, thusly, he repeated this innumerable myriads of times. He then continued saying, the Buddha, Bhagavan, from undifferentiated true suchness speaks of all dharmas as undifferentiated from true suchness, even without difference, without shortcomings, without division, unarisen, uncreated. I now also take refuge in this, at that time, Venerable Ananda spoke to Bhadra saying, if your refuge is in the Buddha's Dharma of true tathata, of true suchness, what in the nature of the Buddha Dharma have you attained? The magician replied saying, I myself am of the nature of the Tathagata's Dharma. Why is this so? The Tathagata and I are without duality and without division. Because all dharmas are true Tathata, true suchness, they are deemed true suchness. And all dharmas are without any different nature. All sentient beings are also like this. The Venerable Ananda should know that what is without duality is without discrimination, and this is non-duality. For what reason? This is because the wisdom of the Buddha is fully knowing that dharmas are mere names. Venerable Ananda, before the Buddha, Venerable Ananda, before the Buddha, said, Amazing Bhagavan! This Bhadra even has such wisdom and eloquence. Before, he always baffled the world with his illusory transformations. And now, he is baffling the world with his wisdom. The Buddha spoke to Bhadra saying, Virtuous man, are you really doing that? Bhadra replied, As the Buddha establishes those matters which baffle the world, I also baffle the world. Why is this so? This is because the Buddha, the Bhagavan, from being without self, speaks <clears throat> of the existence of sentient beings and of life, causing the world to be baffled. In the Tathagata's realization of enlightenment, of bodhi, awakening, there is no perception of even the slightest dharmas of birth and death, and yet he speaks of birth and death. As I understand it, only the Tathagata greatly baffles the world. The Buddha said, excellent, excellent good man. It is just as you have spoken. The Buddhas, the Tathagatas, from being without self and even being apart from all birth and death, according to worldly conventions, speak of sentient beings, life and death, and so forth. There is also not even the slightest dharma, which could be called nirvana. And from this realization of the attainment of nirvana, they speak of nirvana. When Bhadra heard this spoken, he addressed the Buddha saying, I wish to leave the home life and become a bhikshu. At that time, the Bhagavan spoke to Maitreya Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, saying, you should shave the hair and beard of this good man Bhadra and give him the complete uh, precepts. In accordance with the Buddha's instruction, 
Maitreya Bodhisattva allowed Bhadra to leave the home life and receive the complete precepts. After leaving home, Bhadra again addressed the Buddha saying, Bhagavan, this leaving the home life is merely form and appearance and is not truly leaving the home life. If bodhisattvas have truly left home, then they depart from all appearances and mature sentient beings throughout the triple realm. These may be called those who have truly left home. After saying these words, 5,000 sentient beings developed the mind of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi and were completely liberated from their mental outflows. At that time, Ananda addressed the Buddha saying, Bhagavan, what should we name this sutra and how should we bear it in mind? The Buddha said to Ananda, this sutra is called the Dharma gateway of the pronouncement or prophecy given to Bhadra the magician. It is also called the Dharma gateway of the gradual realization of Bodhi awakening. If there are sentient beings in a future kalpa who wish to perceive the Tathagata and do the work of the Buddha for sentient beings, then they should accept, maintain, study, recite, and extensively speak of this sutra to others. And why is this? This person has perceived the Tathagata and has also done the work of the Buddha. Therefore, Ananda, if someone accepts, maintains, studies, recites, and transmits this sutra to others, then it is to, to benefit and to gladden all sentient beings. If one wishes to develop the destiny going to up to supreme awakening, to supreme bodhi, then one should diligently cultivate according to this sutra, since this sutra is able to produce supreme awakening. All right, I'm going to pause there. There's really just a little bit more sort of the end of the sutra. Um, everybody vows to uphold the sutra. Everybody's very happy. I, I only have a few minutes left and I certainly want to touch on a few things before I go. Um, before I do anything, jump out at anybody I'm in desperate need of answers or enlightening insights. Hey, Michael. Well, yeah. I don't know. Are we going to talk about the prophecy itself? Because... Uh, that's what I was going to end the smile. I was going to get back to the smile. What do you have in yeah. mind, though? Well, it just struck me like a aha moment. I, I've been wondering for a while why the prophecy is needed in order for a bodhisattva to become a Tathagata. Uh, you will you surely know many other sutras where a bodhisattva receives that prophecy. And it's kind of like an important step, apparently. And I've been wondering precisely why is that prophecy needed or necessary in that way? But what it struck me as, uh, wow, aha moment. And I'm kind of go, gonna go a little bit mystical here, but it's in the line where in this translation says, why? Because it is the wisdom of the Buddha to know that all dharmas are names only. And yeah, as we just heard, every time there's this prophecy given, uh, the name of the Tathagata is also formulated. So how do you produce Tathagatas? You have to name them first. And that was my, <clears throat> ah, that's why the prophecy is needed moment. Excellent, excellent, Eric. <laughs> um, truly excellent. Um, yeah, uh, Eric's read on that is really interesting. Uh, in particular, you know, um, Vach speech uh, is very, very key to all of this. Not, of course, just because all dharmas are names only, and very much uh, uh, Eric's aha moment is, is really related to that in terms of the names of these uh, future Buddhas, the names of their Buddha lands. You know, there's a lot going on with that. And I, 
I don't, I want, I want to say the few things that I wanted to say, but I want everybody to know that what Eric said is like really, really interesting. But I do want to take a step back. So the smile is sort of related, of course, to this prophecy of enlightenment that, the, oh, Bhadra is going to become a Buddha in, you know, 92,000 kalpas. But it would seem that that is what is prompting the Buddha to smile is he's stoked. He's totally stoked that Bhadra is going to become a Buddha, right? The one thing that I wanted to add to that is, you know, I, I would look through a, a lot of things getting ready for tonight. And it's interesting because it, I, it, it isn't all the time, but it's most of the time that if you see a statue or an image of a Buddha, not necessarily a Bodhisattva, certainly not a Tibetan wrathful deity, but if you look at a kind of standard representation of the Buddha, he has a very slight smile not teeth grinning, you know, smile, but a slight smile. And I have heard, and I, I've been in many Dharma talks where I've heard comments on that. Wonderful, beautiful, beautiful upayak comments on why, is, why do Buddhists smile, right? One of the most profound uh, actually happened to me during a meditation retreat where the person leading the retreat reminded us all about the fact that the Buddhas are always slightly smiling and that we too should not be meditating dourly or meditating like, and as soon as the, the, the Dharma teacher said that, I slightly smiled and it completely changed my meditation. It made it so much more joyful, so much more buoyant, and so there was that. And, and so that was oh, 10, 15 years ago. And it has always stayed with me. Oh, that's why statues of the Buddha are smiling, trying to re remind us, lighten up, you know, kind of a thing. That was in a very upa truly upayak teaching because it improved my meditation. It improved all of our meditation. And so it was truly effective and upayak in that way. After reading this, though, I can't help but see the statue smiling at, by bestowing the prophecy of one's future enlightenment in that way. Maybe a little along Eric's line of being a little mystical in that sense, but I think it's a kind of an interesting addition to that idea of the Buddha's looking down at Bhadra smiling because he knows he's, he's going to achieve Buddhahood someday. And maybe that's why all the Buddhas are smiling because they know we will all achieve Buddhahood someday. Perhaps, right? <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? Well, sure. it's a, a little bit of a, a feedback loop there because the Buddha is smiling, they're making you know, you smile, which is then more likely to lead you to <laughs> where they're, where they think you're going. <laughs> Excellent. Totally. Beautiful. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that might pretty much uh, do it. I have a few more yeah, I had a few other things, but I think they would get a little too out of hand. So um, if there's not any more questions, comments, answers, or ideas, this is going to conclude this sutra. And so I want to give everybody a, a sneak peek at what's going to come in next week and beyond. So there is a sutra that I have really been wanting to teach. I've been really wanting to like dig into it. Um, and that sutra is, let me, where'd it go? So that sutra is called, the standard English translation is the lion's roar of Queen Srimala. And so it is the, or sometimes it's just called the Srimala Deva Sutra, the uh, Queen Srimala. 
So it is one of the jewels in the pile of jewels. It's one of the Ratnakuta collection. I think it is, it's actually the 48th of the 49 sutras in the Ratnakuta collection. So we're gonna stick with our heap of jewels and we're gonna study that next time or starting next time. Um, but I wanna share with you um, a few things. So this is a good sutra because we have a lot of versions of this sutra. Unlike some of the other sutras that we've studied where we might only have one Chinese translation and we might only have one English translation. And so we're relying on my mediocre Chinese and in this to like muddle our way through it. This sutra has been translated into English several times. Um, of course, it is in the Chang translation, but I want to point everybody to a book. I've mentioned it before. There's a really great book called Women in Buddhism uh, by Diana Paul. This is a really great book. It's all uh, partial translations of sutras. It's not, I don't think any of them are complete. I think all of them are just excerpts, uh, but she has great introductions to them as well. And so she has a chapter on the Queen Srimala, uh, the Lion's Roar of Queen Srimala Sutra. And she recently uh, published, or she didn't publish, but she translated the whole thing, and it was published in this book. So the BDK uh, Tripitaka that's coming out, uh, this is a uh, translation, ongoing translation project. Um, so her, her translation is full and complete in here. And then one of the granddaddies of Buddhist studies in English, Alex Wayman, has translated it as well. So we have a lot of English translations to go off of. We have several Chinese translations as well. And so uh, I or whoever else out there is working with Chinese will be able to uh, match those up. And this is a very special sutra. It's one of those sutras that I really enjoy uh, because it has the fem a female protagonist. And this is a really, you know, beautiful aspect to Mahayana Buddhism is the role of women in it, frankly, that it is very um, uh, egalitarian, I guess you would call it. Um, and so this is kind of a really fun sutra because it is, as the title says, the lion's roar of Queen Srimala, who is a relatively young uh, queen of a region. Um, and it is about her teaching the Dharma. And so I think it's a beautiful sutra to uh, kind of transition to. I kind of had a bunch of different ones up in the air. Um, and again, I've just wanted to do this one for so long. And so now is the time. Uh, so again, uh, those are the all the references to it. Yep. And I think that's all I kind of have to say, unless, be, again, people have questions, comments, answers, or ideas. Tanya. Is there an online version that you, that might be accessible for the upcoming sutra that you might recommend we look at? I will definitely track one down if it, exi if it exists, which I'm sure it does. I will track one down and send the link to Gnome, so we'll have it for next week, and I can send it to you, Tanya. Um, uh, but yeah, that'll be key for us um, 21st centuries, uh, 21st century people to have a, an online version. Yeah, there must be one. It's so popular. Um, but yeah. All right. That's going to do it for me. I'm going to pass it over to Gnome for any question or any uh, thing for SFDC. Thank you all uh, so much. Thank you, thank you, Michael. That was really a stupendous. And uh, thank you to the, the, the group, the Sangha.